Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, a good evening to those of you for whom it is evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Gabe Winan uh, to you all today. I will be brief and I will try not to be too embarrassing. Uh, there are many academics who aim to have an impact both as a scholar and as a writer for the broader public. Few achieve it and fewer still achieve it in the way that uh, Gabe has. Professor Wynant teaches in the history department at the University of Chicago. His first book, The Next Shift, The Fall of Manufacturing for the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America, has been a sensation by the standards of uh, academic publishing. It recently won the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize from the Organization of American Historians, which recognizes the best first book by a historian working on some aspect of American history. The list of past winners is really an impressive group of people. Uh, and I, I, it, it's a stamp of uh, great confidence in both this book and in the future of Gabe's uh, career that he has won that prize. Um, uh, named, of course, after one of the University of Wisconsin's <clears throat> own professors, although I don't know, maybe due for a renaming. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, <clears throat> Gabe Wynan is also a brilliant essayist and political thinker who's influential Essays have appeared in Dissent, where he's a member of the editorial board, N Plus One, The Nation, and many other publications. Uh, as a measure of the impact of Gabe's work, I think it is fair to attribute the return of the discussion of the PMC professional managerial class to a piece that he wrote for N Plus One, though I hasten to add that it would be entirely unfair to blame him for the low level to which that discussion has sometimes stooped. Uh, Gabe writes movingly, empathetically, and rigorously about how politics intersect with ordinary life both in his historical work and when he comments on contemporary life. He is, on top of that, a big fan of the Haven Center, so he has good taste. And um, in my opinion, he does great honor to its tradition by speaking to us today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gabriel Wynant. Well, thank you for that uh, very warm and generous introduction, Patrick. Thanks to everyone uh, involved in organizing this event, Patrick. Barrett, as well as Patrick Iber, uh, Janan Asad, Adrian Pagatch, I don't know how to say your last name, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, and uh, Peter Ramond. Uh, it's really uh, an honor for me to be here. I, as, as Patrick was just alluding to, I, I, I told him that before we started, when I was in graduate school, I, I got a kind of trove of audio files of dozens, maybe hundreds of Haven Center events from a couple of, across a couple of decades. Uh, an older graduate student gave this to me, and I would sort of drive around New England and you know the Mid Atlantic, listening to these for years. Uh, and some of them are really you know very formative for me. For example, the series of lectures um, Michael Burvoy gave, uh, trying to work through his his relationship to Bourdieu. I mean, but I could go down the list. Um, so anyway, it's really an institution that, although I've never been there, uh, I have very I have an kind of intense relationship with it, very powerful, fond feelings for. Um, so on that note, let me uh, share my screen. I'm going to be doing a, um, a slideshow as I talk today. Um, it's just a picture of my book. Um, and uh, I guess I'll get started. So this is, uh, I'm going to describe to you today the kind of basic outlines of some of the um, what I think of or hope is the significance of the argument that I try to develop in my new book, which is called The Next Shift. Um, and from my perspective, the book, the project really arises from um, a kind of problem or frustration in, with the ways that we have understood um, class and class politics and class inequality in America. And this slide and the next few slides will give you an example of this. This is an instance of a phenomenon that I'm sure you all are very familiar with. This is, you know, it arose in 2015, 2016. You know, a national newspaper travels to a coal town or a steel town somewhere in the Rust Belt, interviews people at a diner, right? I pay attention to these stories. And as, as I uh, got in the habit of doing that, I noticed that they often display this particular pattern, as you see here. This is the New York Times in Indianapolis, um, the famous carrier plant there. And you'll note, as I've highlighted, uh, this comparison between the union president and his granddaughter, Haley Duncan, who is about to finish college and take a job in healthcare that pays $14.50 an hour. Here we are again with the Times, this time in Williamson, West Virginia, that's a coal town, where they're interviewing uh, a waitress named Kayla Berger, who took an offer from minor wives to train as phlebotomists, but with so many minors out of work, 
the phlebotomy market was flooded. And at the newly opened pulmonary clinic for patients with black lung, Patricia Sigmund, a respiratory therapist, had been caught in the trickle down. Here we are with Politico in uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, that's a steel town. And in fact, uh, Politico returned numerous times to Johnstown where their native informant was Maggie Freer, a retired nurse. Um, and so she's a kind of recurring feature in their coverage in 2016. Um, and here again with the Times, this time in Manesson, Pennsylvania, uh, that's a steel town outside Pittsburgh where they interviewed Josh Turkovich, who has recently taken a technical support job in a Pittsburgh hospital. So this is a very interesting phenomenon, although somewhat annoying, I thought, because um, there seems to be some way in which healthcare workers are forcing their way into these stories as though from without, right? They're not who they're not the kind of target of the journalistic gaze and not who's being looked for, uh, but they're nonetheless finding their way into these kind of representations of what these kinds of deindustrializing places are going through. And there's a simple reason for that, which is that there are so many of them uh, in all of these towns, as in fact, in the United States as a whole, uh, healthcare is the largest sector of employment. Nationwide, it's about one in seven jobs in each of these places, it's higher than that. And that'll be an argument, why that is will be an argument I developed today. Uh, but this seemed to me to kind of make an academic point, a way to uh, this problem or this disjuncture between um, the target of the kind of representative gaze, let's say the journalistic gaze and the actual figure who appeared in the frame seemed to me to be a way to get at a kind of problem that has emerged in a uh, scholarly representation of the study of social class over the last generation or more. Um, to sum this up quickly, in many of these books I'm showing to you here are examples of different scholars kind of trying to grapple with this problem. Um, with the process of deindustrialization, labor union decline, and the fall of state socialism, uh, the category, the kind of Marxist categories that we used to understand social class fell into crisis. This is a very widely discussed and widely known phenomenon. Um, and, um, you know, that happened because the kind of theory of history that those categories seem to rest upon or took as implicit uh, seemed in some way to be disproven by that sequence of events, right? How could it be that the kind of teleology of working class formation that is supposed to, you know, uh, lead to the transcendence of capitalism and its contradictions, in fact, ran backwards? Um, and my view increasingly was and continues to be that this conceptual problem arose because of a confusion, a profound confusion between class as a concept and as a kind of abstract, uh, abstract phenomenon that is developed theoretically, primarily within Marxism as well as in adjacent traditions, and the prime example of that class, or of that, sorry, of that concept, which is the industrial working class that emerges across the uh, industrial world at the end of the 19th century, consolidates itself organizationally and politically over the first half of the 20th century, and then begins to disintegrate organizationally and politically in the later part of the 20th century. Um, and in US history in particular, uh, it, within the academic field, I think uh, the, the scholarly field itself emerged internally to that cycle, was part of that cycle. The actual practitioners and the, the kind of founders of the modern field of American labor history were almost universally the children of um, working class, left wing, uh, Jewish or Italian or uh, African American union members. Very frequently, uh, they, you know, as to be trained as scholars, they went to public universities that had been expanded by the New Deal state. Uh, so they emerged. The field itself emerged from within that cycle of working class formation. Um, and I, that parallels to that, it developed, I think, in many other national kind of traditions. And that uh, fact made it very hard to carry out any kind of disentangling of the kind of conceptual apparatus or theoretical apparatus that we use to understand class in general. And the particular very important and significant historical example that we had taken as synonymous with the more general phenomenon. This kind of came to a head in debates in the 1990s um, as the foundation, the kind of theoretical foundations of class analysis as it was practiced were challenged in particular by um, feminists, post-structuralists, a uh, variety of anti-racist scholars who pointed out that the concept seemed to carry a set of assumptions about who in particular we're talking about when we talk about workers 
And uh, maybe the figure of the worker is not as stable as all of that. Maybe, the, maybe there are assumptions about who a worker is um, run a little bit too deep. And I think largely American labor history rejected that challenge to its own detriment. And so my own project has been involved in trying to, um, as I say, kind of engage in a certain kind of disentangling uh, conceptually and historically. Um, and such that we might be able to defetishize to some extent the figure of the industrial worker. And it seemed to me that there was an opportunity to do that, to represent class, as has sometimes been said, um, by taking a hard look at the transformation in the actual division of labor in society, uh, the actual structure of work materially, who does it, whose job it is to do what, that has happened since the industrialization has occurred. Uh, we might be able to kind of break the deadlock if we did that. Um, and so in this graph, I'm just showing you a couple of things. One is a very simple, uh, probably familiar graph in some form, which is the increase of women's labor force participation over the course of the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. Quite significant phenomenon, obviously happening most rapidly, as you can see, between the mid 60s and the late 90s. Uh, in conjunction with this, though, um, I mean, this story is often told as one of feminist liberation and for good reason, right? Women get to enter the, the labor market and achieve a kind of economic independence um, that is transformative in their lives in many ways. At the same time, however, it's also a story about class inequality in an important way. Uh, as a sociologist Rachel Dwyer shows, um, this is a very heavily class polarized pro process, the entry of women into the labor market over the course of the end of the 20th century. Uh, and in particular, if we look at what she calls and what I would echo her in calling the care economy, that's to say uh, education, healthcare, elder care, child care, forms of food service and domestic work, the care economy accounts for 56% of all new low wage jobs in the 1980s, 63% of all new low wage jobs in the 1990s, and 72%, actually I think it's 74, I think it's a typo on my part, of all new low wage jobs in the 2000s. Uh, these care jobs continue to be held overwhelmingly by women. So I wanted to do a kind of case study of a place going through some of these changes. So I could try to carry out what I'm describing to you as this disentangling type work. Pittsburgh presented itself as a pretty good option, I thought, because it was so intensely specialized in a particular kind of classic type of industrial production. Um, that steel, what you see on the left here is the Jones and Lachlan steel mill, one of many gigantic integrated steel mills that used to operate in Pittsburgh. You can just get a sense of the scale of it, right? It can't really even be captured in one picture. And it's sort of a similar scale to the downtown of the city um, in the background. Um, and Pittsburgh has been a place that scholars have gone for a long time to try to understand the, pro the social problems and social dynamics of industrial capitalism because it was so specialized in such a kind of central capitalist industry. Um, today, uh, the largest employer, not just in Pittsburgh, but in fact in Pennsylvania, is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, you see on the right here, UPMC uh, is the largest tenant, quite conveniently for my purposes, in the tallest building on the Pittsburgh skyline, which is U.S. Steel Tower, but they had to take down USS from the top and put up UPMC when UPMC became the biggest tenant. Um, so I thought this transition maybe would be a good way of trying to figure out some of these dynamics and sorting out some of this confusion between what's the kind of general phenomena, what are the general phenomena of social class and class inequality, and then what is the kind of flux in the particular organization, the particular instances of social class and class inequality. Um, and to get at this, I, th I thought I would have to try to explore the ways that um, care work in particular has been distinctively organized over time. So in 2013, as I was formulating this project, uh, UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, claimed before a, um, a before the National Labor Relations Board that it has no employees and engages in no operations or industrial relations of any kind. Um, and this was an argument that was technically kind of based on games of uh, parent company and subsidiary. Um, but it also seems significant in another way that's quite parallel to those newspaper stories that I, was, I began with. Um, the way that healthcare workers seem to be everywhere and nowhere, care workers in general seem to be everywhere and nowhere, right? That they're proliferating in number, that's the largest sector of the labor market. And yet, uh, journalists seem not to notice when that's, that's who they're interviewing. 
uh, their employers claim that they don't exist. This seemed to me an important part of the problem that I was trying to get at. What does social class actually look like after deindustrialization, and why has it been so hard for us to see? Uh, moreover, I found as I began to dig into the story that this is not the first time this has been argued. Uh, in 1940, the uh, rising CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the kind of new union movement of, of the New Deal period, attempted to organize hospitals in Pittsburgh, um, in particular a group of black nurses uh, at West Penn Hospital. And all of the hospitals in the region, uh, well, let me say here, the legal status of hospital workers was ambiguous at, at this point, whether or not they were covered by labor law was not, was not determined yet. So all of the hospitals in the region banded together, filed an injunction in court to claim, as you see here, that they are not employers. Um, now their legal reasoning was a little bit different from UPMC's reasoning in 2013, but I don't think that's actually that important for our purposes here. What's important here is that I have, you have these two markers laid down by the same institutions, in fact, in 1940 and 2013, saying the same thing at both points, which is that we are not in an employment relationship with this workforce. However, over the period of time in between, this workforce has expanded to become the largest workforce, again, in the city, in the state, and in the country. Um, so part of what I started to suspect was that there might be a story of an important story of continuity as well as a story of change going across the kind of divide of deindustrialization. Here is a graph for you, a, um, a kind of simple representation of employment in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, the, the solid line is healthcare and social assistance, which is the census category. Um, and the dotted line are the metal industries. And you can see they would appear to form a kind of perfect X with the, with the um, Rap, period of rapid transition be occurring between 1970 and 1990. So again, um, corresponding in time to the transformation in the gender division of labor also. Um, so this doesn't necessarily prove anything in itself, right? But it's a very suggestive kind of correspondence. Um, and increasingly I began to suspect that these processes might be not just running in kind of inverse parallel to each other, but might actually be linked in some way causally. Uh, this suspicion was sort of strengthened when I realized that these kind of outsized healthcare workforces have a particular geographical concentration, uh, which I think suggests itself pretty clearly when you look at the chart I'm showing you here. Um, so these are urbanized counties by percentage of workforce employed in healthcare and social assistance. This is from 2017 when I, when I made this chart. Uh, hasn't changed that much though. Um, and you can see uh, what part of the region, what, what region of the country we're talking about here, right? There's no California anywhere on this, this list. There's not, nowhere in the South except for uh, at the very bottom, um, one, one Rio Grande uh, border town. And this is almost exclusively a list. Uh, oh, and St. Petersburg, Florida is here too. But almost exclusively, this is a list of um, the Rust Belt, of the industrialized places. Um, so, it seemed to me there is some echo, some historical shadow of the industrial economy that once existed that continues to live on in the form of these outsized healthcare workforces, outsized healthcare industries, which suggests some historical linkage between them um, and thereby might give away of both carrying out the kind of dissociating, the analytical dissociation I wanted to do between the particular example of industrial workers and the general concept of class, and also to figure out how uh, this kind of new working class both has been formed, why it has the shape that it has, and why it has this kind of quality of invisibility that it appears to have. Um, but this is a project, as I've laid it out to you thus far, uh, if you're going to do disentangling, you can't just focus on the thing that you want to elevate, right? You also have to kind of take on the phenomena that uh, seems to occupy kind of outsized or fetishized importance. So I had to start with steel itself, it seemed to me. Uh, and I, in doing that, something that became very clear to me very quickly was that beneath the kind of nostalgic haze for a golden age of American capitalism that was more socially equal, there was actually a lot more turbulence than we often uh, like to acknowledge. This is an image that you're seeing here that I found in the archive of uh, a wildcat strike at a Pittsburgh steel mill. Uh, it was over a strike that was called, uh, you know, in violation of the contract by about 500 workers. Um, over working conditions, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, and the numbers, I just want to point out to you the numbers on this photo. Uh, this image was captured from inside the plant office. 
so that they could identify who was participating in this illegal work stoppage and punish them. Uh, and so the numbers are, in, you know, they were created in the moment in, in 1959. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm having a slide issue. Here we go. Uh, so there's a structural problem that emerges in American industry, basically as soon as the Korean War is over. Um, and you can see it very clearly in steel. Uh, the relatively oligopolistic organization of American industries means that they're not under an enormous amount of competitive pressure. Uh, and they can pass on some of their rising labor costs to their customers. In the case of the steel industry, that's particularly the, the auto industry. That's the, the auto is the biggest customer of steel. Um, and try to keep up with their rising employment costs. But over the long term, this trajectory is going to become difficult for them, in particular because the federal government is not very happy to have steel prices rising all of the time. However, because there's not very much competitive pressure and because they have such an enormous amount of um, fixed capital already invested in their particular production processes, they're also not that quick to update their uh, technology in, in, in conjunction with technological innovation in the industry. This is true in various ways across American industries. It's just particularly true in steel. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, fluctuation in steel production, therefore, over the course of the post-war period. You can see, on the one hand, pretty steadily rising capacity from 1940, really 1940 onward, with just one dip in 45, um, but quite a lot of fluctuation. Uh, in actual production. That fluctuation in actual production at the level of daily life is going to mean a regular kind of drumbeat of cyclical layoffs for steel workers. Um, there are recessions, as you can see here, in uh, 49, 50, let's see, in 54, uh, there's a recession, there's a recession in 56, 57, there's a recession in 60, 61. There are also strikes periodically through this period. So it's very standard for steel workers to be out of work for a couple months, basically every year. Um, and this generates some certain kind of tension with the kind of golden age mythology about this kind of work, which in fact existed already in the moment. And I think a very good example of this is an episode that you all probably know, when in 1959, Nixon goes to Moscow to do the, um, you know, the kind of American exposition with uh, Khrushchev and they have what's called the kitchen debate. This is literally how that episode begins, right? They step into the American kitchen and this is what happens. Nixon says, I wanna show you this kitchen. It is like those of our houses in California. Khrushchev says, we have such things. Nixon says, this is our newest model. This is the kind which is built in thousands of units for direct installations in the houses. In America, we like to make life easier for women. Khrushchev says, your capitalistic, capitalistic attitude toward women does not occur under communism. Nixon says, I think that this attitude toward women is universal. What we want to do is make life more easy for our housewives. This house can be bought for $14,000 and most American veterans from World War II can buy a home in the bracket of 10,000 to 15,000. Let me give you an example you can appreciate. Our steel workers, as you know, are now on strike, but any steel worker could buy this house. They earn $3 an hour. This house costs about $100 a month to buy on a contract running 25 to 30 years. So here you have, at the kind of highest possible level of sort of official Cold War ideology, uh, an invocation of the economic security of steelworkers and in particular the comfort of their families um, as the kind of official ideology you know, of the period. Um, and that's very powerful. That ramifies out down to everyday life in all kinds of ways. It's a very powerful force. Um, but it turns out to not quite be true that steelworkers can actually live that way. Um, According to a Bureau of Labor Statistics study from the same exact moment, um, what they define as a modest but adequate living uh, would, would consist of the following, uh, $6,200 per year for a family of four, which is in fact smaller than most steelworker families would be, with a rented dwelling of only four rooms, not an owned home, a used car acquired every four years, a television every 15 years, uh, and then, as you can see, uh, a handful of items of new clothing for each of their kids each year. Now, this would be possible on an average annualized hourly wage of 336. Now, that sounds possible, right? Nixon just said they are three dollars an hour. They could buy this house. It turns out, however, that because of the cyclical periodic in interruptions in employment uh, that are endemic to industrial work in general, to steel work in particular, that the average steel worker, in fact, falls short of uh, this standard of living. So there's something kind of fundamentally wrong 
with the uh, kind of golden age image as it's represented in the moment and as we continue to re remember it to a significant degree, uh, just at a basic economic level, before we even begin to layer in questions about race and gender, which are really important to this, uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Um, but now let's layer in race and gender, which are very important to what's, uh, what's in, incomplete or inaccurate about that story. Um, so because it has this very large, virtually all male industrial specialization in steel, Pittsburgh develops a kind of very distinctive or exemplary gender division of labor, distinctive and exemplary in that it exaggerates uh, the kind of housewife breadwinner dyad model that is characteristic of post-war uh, working class uh, employment. As you can see in this, um, this chart on the right here, married women participate in the labor market at lower rates in Pittsburgh, the nationwide, by quite significant degrees, um, especially so actually for African-American married women because black steel workers are, um, you know, you know that, that creates a kind of anomaly, a shrinking but significant anomaly of stable male black employment, at, which is generally being wiped out nationwide and increasingly in Pittsburgh also over this period. Um, so you have a lot of housework being done in this context. The families are often larger than four, and there are various qualities of living in uh, the social world of blue collar Pittsburgh that require a high degree of what economists would call domestic production. Um, there's a few ways of understanding this. One has to do with the kind of temporal cycles of working class life. So pit steel mills run 24 hours a day, even with a high degree of seniority, therefore men are often going to be on uh, night shifts which means that you're going to, women are going to have to cook multiple meals. They're going to have to keep children quiet during the day when their father is sleeping at nighttime, so, sorry, sleeping during the day because he was working through the night. Um, as uh, this diary entry that I'm showing you in the background says, quote, what, this is from a, a steelworker's wife, washed clothes all day today. Ted went out four to 12 for his first four to 12 in a long time. I sorted clothes and ironed till 12, till 20 after one. Then we both went to bed at about 1.30. Pretty tired tonight. Um, here's another good example. I used to sleep most of the day because I'd stay up all night washing the kids' clothes. I always cooked a meal when he came in. We were more or less in and out of the kitchen all day long, says another, or another still, cooking and cleaning was all I ever did. So there's a high degree of domestic production, that's to say, what we think of as housework. Uh, it's not just that having economic security from the steel mill frees up a woman to kind of uh, engage in housework as she pleases, rather the, the social and economic conditions of steelwork intensify housework. This also has an ecological dimension. Um, as you can see in these final two quotations here, um, we used to run to grab our clothes off the line when we saw big clouds of smoke coming from the mills. In fact, many women living in the steelworker neighborhoods would learn which whistles and sirens meant which kind, uh, you know, would uh, anticipate which kinds of emissions would follow from which whistles and sirens so that they could know if they would have to go get their clothes off the line. And there was just kind of a constant uh, cleaning of soot and grime and dust off of everything, off of surfaces of the home, off of the car, off of the body of the steel worker himself and, and off of his clothes, which would be coated in industrial grease. He would have filth above his eyelids uh, when he came home in his hair, under his fingernails, etc. Uh, it's an extremely industrialized environment and that itself intensified housework. Um, an important part of this gender division of labor also consisted of forms of uh, informal but quite vital care. It remains the case down to the present that uh, domestic-based care work for elders and disabled people, especially as well as children, uh, falls overwhelmingly on women. And that was even more intense in a society that more or less formalized the gender division of labor. Um, in particular, uh, working class people often entered old age with a relatively high disease burden, um, both because of the environment that they lived in, because of the dangers of work itself. Um, and there was, there was a large and growing number, I'll talk more about this in a moment, of elderly people in the demographic structure. And so there was a high demand for informal uh, elder care and health care from women and girls and families. And that was an important part of the socialization of girls into being women. Um, as one uh, steelworker's wife says, I neglect myself. I take care of everyone else in the family that's sick. I enjoy it really. So 
what happens to this system then, uh, the, this kind of social world that's built up in relation to, to buffer the shocks of steelwork? What happens to it when steelwork begins to decline? Here's this graph again, just to give you a sense of the time period, the chronology of the decline of industrial employment. I think we often assume that uh, deindustrialization in basic industries like steel happened in this in the 1980s and does fall, employment does fall very steeply in the 1980s. But you can see there's a long decline beginning way before that. Um, so it's a kind of generational secular grinding process in which low seniority workers get laid off, don't get called back, um, and the workforce gradually shrinks for a long period of time before the sudden snap of the early 80s when it kind of falls off a cliff. Well, one thing that's important to understand for understanding this is uh, the uh, racial politics and racial dimensions of labor market change. Um, in general, as was true across American industry, African-American men were, uh, although they had access to these jobs and to union membership, which was different from prior to the New Deal, they nonetheless uh, were caught in internal structures of racial discrimination within both unions and uh, by employers that would trap them in the um, least desirable and least stable industrial jobs, which meant that they would be in the kind of classic pattern, last hired, first fired in any given kind of cycle. This in turn uh, pushed the kind of growing crisis of what we call a kind of Fordist economy, uh, racialized this, the forms of reproductive labor that African-American women were, uh, or the racialized reproductive labor, that's to say these kind of forms of care work and pushed African-American women to uh, have to politicize the kinds of labor they had to engage in for their own uh, their, and their family's own survival. So there, the early and high rates of African-American male unemployment then lead to uh, new kinds of black women's uh, both employment in the labor market and activism, both about that employment and about their broader economic conditions. So here you see an image from the uh, welfare rights movement in Pittsburgh, which is again, a national movement, but one that had a significant presence in Pittsburgh. Its leader in Pittsburgh, Frankie Mae Jeter was a, in fact, a hospital laundry worker. Um, and they organized to um, improve conditions for in, in a variety of ways in respect for um, welfare recipients. Uh, I think most significantly, they advocated for the uh, reopening or the uh, reopening of funds for the Planned Parenthood in Pittsburgh, which had been closed off under pressure from uh, a combination of Catholic priests and Black nationalists who argued that abortion was genocide. Um, and the welfare rights organization succeeded in winning the refunding of Planned Parenthood by the federal you know, poverty program. And they also uh, succeeded in winning a lawsuit to secure the recognition of non-biological kin guardians of children as the uh, recipients of cash benefits on behalf of those children, which is very important in the social world where family units, and this is true for black and white families alike, uh, family units really had to kind of uh, cooperate with one another and in fact with their friends and with their neighbors to buffer against these periodic economic shocks of downturns and strikes and recessions. Um, there's also, as I said, a kind of politicization uh, even of employment itself for African-Americans and African-American women in particular. I'm gonna talk more about the healthcare industry in a moment, but I just wanna to point to this moment in 1969, 1970, uh, when hospital workers in um, Pittsburgh's hospitals, although they don't come under the protection of the national labor relations system, they have no formal legal union rights, nonetheless try to form a union um, and it's because they have none of those rights that they describe the, the employment situation as dictatorship, as you can see here, and a plantation, slavery, and uh, paternalism, as you see here. Uh, the hospital can and does uh, retaliate against them by firing them. In fact, has some of them arrested when they, when they pick it. It brings in a kind of rival union to muddy the waters, all activities that would be illegal uh, in, a, in a legally protected workplace. Um, so there's this kind of wave of African-American activism in the 60s and 70s that's in response to the kind of early crisis of deindustrialization, the way it's beginning to manifest, the way it's hitting Black workers hardest and calling a question of survival and economic well-being as, uh, in particular, African-American women have to navigate both the welfare state and the available forms of employment, such as healthcare. Um, but I want to return to this kind of 
larger pattern of deindustrialization and talk about how it intersects with the healthcare system, which is really the core of my argument today. Um, first of all, there's a demographic dimension of this that we need to um, that we need to understand. The process of the secular decline of the steel industry produces a an older population over time. The industry would never be as large, it's work the workforce would never be as large as it was in 1950. Uh, and that as that cohort ages and is not replaced at the steel mill, young people, especially young men, decide, decide to leave. Um, and so you get over the, this period of time, this increasingly aged population overall. And this is, again is a kind of common pattern of deindustrialization, which Pittsburgh exaggerates from 11% over 65 to nearly 14% to 17%. You can see the way that Pittsburgh is outpacing the country as a whole on this measure. Um, by 1990, Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh sits, would be the second oldest urbanized county in the country after Broward and Florida. Uh, so you have this population that is decreasingly attached to secure industrial employment, that is aging in place, but uh, also is ensconced within a network of social benefits that have been won through the process of class conflict, through the process of industrial conflict um, over the post-war period. And here I wanna talk about the healthcare system in particular. So in 1949, uh, in a steel industry case, the federal judiciary rules that unionized employers have to bargain over health insurance and pensions. That's a kind of what's called a mandatory subject of collective bargaining. Um, and, Basically prompted by this, unions give up on the ambition to win a national health plan and instead use their economic power to try to secure uh, private sector nonprofit health coverage. And this is really the mechanism by which employment based health insurance becomes generalized in post war America. It has to do with this shift in collective bargaining in particular. Um, over the course of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Groups like the steelworkers negotiate very, very good pension plan, or sorry, very good uh, health insurance plans. Already by the end of the 50s, you can see this in this chart here, that steel subscribers, that's to say steelworkers and their families are going to the hospital at higher rates. They're using more days of care um, than the general population. That's not in any obvious way, a simple health effect. They're not necessarily help, uh, sicker than the general population, uh, or at least not nearly enough to justify this gap. It's about the quality of their insurance. Um, and in fact, they constitute such a, such a large market for health care, right? This huge group of workers and their families with really good insurance constitute such a large market for health care um, that they stabilize what's called community rating for Blue Cross as a whole in the region, uh, where it says everyone can join Blue Cross on the right here. That's what, what that is about. Blue Cross uh, doesn't assess premia on subscribers based on their, any, for anyone in the region, based on their uh, perceived individual risk um, because of the stabilizing effect of the steel workers on, on their actuarial pool as a whole. Uh, and with this giant and growing market, hospitals in the region begin to renovate, to expand, to improve their services that they offer. Um, here is Homestead Hospital, basically across the street from the famous Homestead Steelworks where the labor battle happened in 1892. And um, this is them opening a new wing, the ceremony that they held when they opened new wing in the late 1950s. This is a wave that moves across the entire regional healthcare industry. It begins to expand to serve this new market. Uh, one, one striking example is that all of these hospitals, basically every steel town has a kind of community hospital like Homestead, and they all rip out their old multi-bed wards and install what's the now familiar two bed room because the uh, steel workers health insurance plan guarantees that. So if there's a market for it, they should put them in. Uh, and over the course of the post-war period on this basis, uh, what health economists call hospital utilization rises very significantly for the region as a whole. And this is really driven by steel workers and their family in particular. So you can see this gap already in 1974. Uh, steel subscribers are using per capita 1.2 inpatient days in 1974. So that means that um, if every steel subscriber used the healthcare system to the same degree, they would have spent 1.2 days in the hospital, all of them in 1974. Um, this is at a higher, a higher rate than all Blue Cross subscribers. And you can see for the entire region, just over the course of the 1970s, this rises to the point 
from uh, that the entire population is generating 1.6 inpatient days per capita uh, by 1979. That's an incredibly high rate. It's triple our national rate at the moment. People are using the hospital very intensely, and they're using it in particular uh, as a kind of buffer against the worsening economic and social situation brought about by deindustrialization. Um, so we can think of the hospital as having these kind of social work and um, long-term care type functions. I think it's helpful here to imagine in particular um, that the increasing loss of access to the unwaged, or to understand that the increasing loss of access to the unwaged work of women and girls and families who are either moving away with their husbands or are being pulled into the labor market to compensate for their husband's lost wages. Uh, elders and sick people therefore are losing their access to that pool of care, but many elders and sick people can compensate for that loss of access by using their really good insurance to get care from um, hospitals and nursing homes, hospitals in particular. Uh, they, their insurance is good enough that that's very easy for them to do. Uh, and the same is true on the employment side. As one home health agency recruiter puts it in these years, the displaced homemaker is tailor-made for the homemaker home health aid position and could be said to have been in training for the position for years. So what has been formerly this sort of domestic function or very significantly a domestic function uh, of unwaged women's work is getting sucked into the labor market. Uh, it's the one opportunity for employment for women that's expanding or for anyone that's expanding and it's for women. Um, amid a larger economic contraction. And it's also a channel of social services and social support for the growing population of elderly and disabled people who need uh, social support and are losing access to it in the form of their daughters and daughters-in-law and wives. Um, so this is a kind of gradual process across the 60s and 70s. But by the early 80s, as you saw in that graph, right, there is this kind of steep decline in employment. And um, it does accelerate this further. So unemployment rises in the region to 17% in 1983. So sort of Great Depression levels um, in the very steep recession induced by, by Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve. The poverty rate doubles between 1976 and 1983. And this puts huge stress on uh, social welfare systems of all kinds. Pennsylvania has the most indebted unemployment, in, uh, unemployment fund in the country um, by the end of this period. And there are steep cuts to public assistance that are brought about first by local government then added to by the Reagan administration, cuts to things like food stamps, housing assistance, um, shelter care for the homeless. You sort of go down the list and virtually any kind of social assistance you're going to see being punished by the, in, the, in the political environment of the early 80s in the same moment when need is expanding really, really rapidly. There's a cascading impact of this on families. Um, Right, even these kind of extended family networks that I've been talking about, where people kind of take care of each other, maybe they move in with each other, they share food, they share resources. Uh, the capacities and resources that these networks have built up over time get overwhelmed by a catastrophe of this depth. As one laid off worker says, even those people who had saved and were ready for retirement, now we're helping their kids and now everybody is out of money. Um, very importantly, an economic shock of this depth has a major health shock function. Uh, a study by a pair of economists in 2009 who went through unemployment filings in Pennsylvania from the early 1980s and looked at the subsequent lifespans of recently unemployed, formerly high seniority industrial workers, found that layoff in the early 1980s increased their mortality hazard by 50 to 100 percent in the immediate aftermath. And that's you know, actually dying is the kind of like tip of the iceberg, right? Beneath that, there's a massive increase of non-lethal forms of health shock, infant malnutrition, domestic violence, heart disease, addiction, depression, suicide, domestic violence, all of these things tick up uh, and add to the kind of stress on what all the existing forms of social support, both familial and state. However, because it has this kind of bizarre public-private structure uh, that has been brought about by private sector publicly regulated collective bargaining, uh, the healthcare industry does not tremble under this pressure. And in fact, it grows because it links the need for the increasing need for social support amid worsening inequality and social disaster. It links that need to opportunities for profit. Um, so even Medicaid, which is a kind of poor stepchild of the healthcare system, 
grow steadily over the course of this period. You can see here Medicaid expenditures uh, increase from 1.2 billion to 1.6 billion over the, in Pennsylvania over the course of these years. Um, and this is really true across the board. In particular, um, the, the re bargained retiree benefits of steel workers become extremely important for um, the population of uh, very large, the very large population of retirees from the steel industry, um, many of whom are also not over 65 and so aren't, don't qualify for Medicaid yet. You can re retire from the steel industry potentially as early as 45. Um, if you have continuous seniority, there's a whole chunk of people between 45 and 65 who either have already retired or take buyout deals to take early retirement in the recession of their early 80s. So you have this very rapidly growing uh, kind of legally elderly population uh, with these very good retiree benefits. And what that means is that uh, there is then, those benefits then constitute a stream of income into these devastated communities. Um, in, sorry, in uh, 1985 alone, for example, it's estimated that a handful of mill towns outside Pittsburgh, uh, in a handful of mill towns outside Pittsburgh in 1985, retiree benefits bring in $125 million in income. Uh, it's overwhelmingly the most important stream of income in these places that are otherwise being drained of economic support and well being. Um, Along with this, there's an influx of capital investment, again, in a region which is being disinvested from very rapidly in other lines of economic activity. You can see here um, from 1979 to 1980, so in the period of the Volcker shock to the, the macroeconomic change, uh, capital investment in Pittsburgh hospitals more than triples and then continues to rise again very rapidly. Now that's about various things having to do with how bond markets work, but it rests upon there being steady and increasing demand for hospital services. Um, here's another kind of way of, of, of skinning this cat. Um, this is a list of top 24 cities in the United States by average length of hospital stay in 1981. Now Pittsburgh is only 24 here, but you'll note again, what kinds of cities we're talking about on this list. Every single one of these, except for Washington DC, is undergoing a similar process, a similar spasm of deindustrialization in this moment. So that process, again, is driving people into the healthcare system as the only available site of social services and social support in a general context of collapse and austerity. With this process, there's rapid increase in employment, again, in a moment when all other labor markets are contracting. Uh, so the, dot, the um, dotted line at the top is kind of Industry, healthcare industry wide trajectory of increasing employment between 1976 and 1982. And then it's broken out here by subsectors. But contrary to what was widely said at the time, and to some extent contrary to what continues to be said now about post industrial cities, this is not an industry of skilled professionals exclusively. Uh, this is a kind of occupational breakdown of the Pittsburgh healthcare industry in 1992 by uh, occupational category and skill and wages. And you can see, um, even if you don't count registered nurses as uh, you know, part of this new working class, which maybe you want to, maybe you don't, that's kind of interesting controversy. Uh, the remaining two thirds from paraprofessionals on down were uh, approximating, making approximate average annual wages of $24,000 and lower. And there are quite a lot of people in these lower categories here as well. Um, so again, thinking about this period of expansion on this graph, right, this is an expansion to a significant degree at the bottom of the labor market. Um, and it goes hand in hand with this, a kind of broader structural transformation of employment in the United States. Um, here in a kind of simple way on the left, you see goods producing versus service producing industry, uh, employment by goods producing versus service, in, service producing industries. Um, right, the flatlining of goods producing is a kind of relative expression of what we call deindustrialization, taken in uh, absolute terms. Um, now, service producing is a big baggy category, obviously, but I think it helps to decompose it, uh, thinking about the productivity dynamics of different sectors of the economy. So if you see here, what has become more expensive uh, between 1997 and 2017, hospital services are at the top of that list. You also have well, interesting college things we could talk about there, but childcare, medical care. Um, what's going on in part is that healthcare 
and the provision of healthcare is very difficult. To, uh, it's a very difficult industry in which you achieve steady and continuous endogenous productivity growth, either through the refinement of the division of labor or the replacement of labor with machinery. Uh, it's really hard to provide healthcare more efficiently than you did last year without in some way degrading the quality of the service itself. Uh, and this in turn causes its cost to rise. I mean, many there's many factors in healthcare costs rising, but this is an important one that causes the cost of healthcare to rise uh, pretty steadily over time because it remains a very labor intensive industry. Um, this in turn creates structural pressure on healthcare employers to suppress wages and suppress staffing levels as much as they can, because that's the main thing that they can control to meet their margins since they can't really achieve productivity increases. So again, taking you back to these statistics I shared at the beginning, um, the reason that this growing category of employment is uh, growing at the bottom of the labor market has to do with this kind of paradox of um, stru structural pressure to grow and to meet demand in combination with firm level pressure to keep costs down. Uh, that, in, that in turn manifests within the healthcare industry as an experience of stress because employers try to limit staffing levels which generate systematic overwork. And um, I won't take you through all these examples because I wanna wrap up soon, but as this document, this is a ar blurry archival document that says, all we know is work, work, work. We are so busy, we actually feel guilty if we ask about one another's personal or family life. We don't have time to be warm and friendly. And this, I think, uh, brings us into the kind of paradox of the essential worker in our own moment. I, most healthcare workers I know kind of hate that phrase now because they feel like they've been treated quite in it, so they're quite inessential, quite disposably. Um, and this is, you know, this is, I think, the core of the paradox, in fact, that and it long predated the pandemic, as I'm trying to argue to you at the moment, going back to the 1970s, at least, uh, there's a category of workers who have functioned as shock absorbers to manage the kind of disruptions and dislocations of changes in our society. And in particular, it's increasing inequality. It's been dumped onto them, uh, and, but it's been possible to dump it onto them exactly because they are positioned externally to the economy, uh, because they weren't protected by labor law, because they um, were employed from the margins of the labor market, because they were seen as hospitals said at both bookends of this talk, not as employees at all. And that actually enabled their institutions to grow and to kind of absorb the social shocks that have happened since, since the 1970s. Uh, what this means is that so-called essential workers, they are essential collectively, right? They have fun they collectively have, and have carried out this function of holding our society together as it becomes more and more unequal and carrying out its sort of successful reproduction um, on terms that workers themselves obviously haven't chosen, but they remain individually disposable as individual firms try to capture as much of the profit and pass on to workers and to patients as much of the cost as they can of that process. Um, and, you know, I think this, to conclude, this means that we need to kind of think about what political possibilities arise from the standpoint of this question of social reproduction, of, that is to say, the work that's involved in reproducing society, holding it together, um, what questions politically arise as social reproduction has been transferred to a significant degree into these social institutions, um, right, somewhat, somewhat out of the home and into this kind of more public context, but a public context that's very heavily shadowed by the history of race and gender that has made it marginal um, over time. And, you know, finally, I do think that uh, to conclude, there is a kind of mechanism of politicization at work here because our collective social interdependence is manifest in these workers uh, who do hold our society together and have done so very visibly over the last couple of years, even as the structural conditions under which they work force them to bear more of the costs of, uh, of that holding together that they accomplish. And uh, that creates a possible alliance between patients and workers as it does between students and teachers. Um, and you know, parallel, there are parallels across all of the care industries. Um, and I think it generates politicization in these industries, and we are beginning to see that in various ways in forms of industrial and political action alike. So I will stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Gabe. That was um, a really fantastic uh, argument, and I think it's going to provide us a lot of rich material to have a wonderful uh, discussion. So 
Um, anyone can ask a question. There are one of two ways of doing so. You are more than welcome to type your question into chat and I will read it out for you. Or you can ask Gabe your question yourself by clicking on the raise hand function under reactions at the bottom of your screen. I will call on you, ask you to unmute, turn on your camera to ask Gabe yourself. I will be taking questions in groups of three, um, presuming a lot of you want to be on stack to participate in discussion. So the floor is open. And as usual, there is always some hesitation about who wants to go first. Awesome. We have, I believe it's Emily. Emily, I'm going to ask you to unmute to ask your question. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm taking a risk here because I've got a sick baby right there. So you might interrupt us, but I'm going to try to get my question before he starts talking. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this talk and I love the book. Uh, and one of the things that struck me is the conversation at the beginning about the academic field of labor history. And I really appreciated the ways you unpack what's been happening um, you know, uh, over the past several decades in that field. And so what struck me is that it seemed to me, and I could be wrong because I'm not an Americanist, you can correct me if I am, but that you would have been working on a pretty unfashionable topic for a part of this research. You know, And now, of course, the uh, importance of this topic is really much more evident. But, um, but if I am right about that, that you are doing a project that in some ways um, was not very much the kind of trend in um, you know, American history at that time. I'm curious about what kinds of uh, networks, either academic or activist or otherwise, shaped your instincts around this project and, and caused you to ask the questions that you were asking. That's a wonderful question. I really appreciate you asking that. Um, I have a lot of things to say about it. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I remember I, I was interested in labor history initially. Um, you know, just out of a set of political commitments. I mean, if you go back a couple generations in my family, you can find, um, you know, like left wing working class kind of new Jewish New York type histories, but it's not proximate for me. Um, and um, I, so it really kind of arose first from a kind of political commitment. And as you're saying, I mean, I remember having the experience in my first couple of years of graduate school saying to like professors I met at conferences, you know, I'm, oh, I'm, I want to do a project in labor history. And this is not an exaggeration. Someone who I will not name, but a senior professor at a very fancy university said to me, labor history, they're still making that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was kind of perfect, right? Because it's both like, are academics still doing that? And is, is that like, is that history still occurring in the world? Um, and um, so I did, you know, I had to obviously try to generate kind of scholarly and intellectual research, resources of different kinds. Uh, but I think that's sort of less interesting than, and was ultimately less formative than my own kind of activist experience in New Haven. So I did my PhD at Yale which is a company town, right? Um, it's a sort of deindustrialized company town. So there used to be a large uh, weapons manufacturing industry, rifles in particular there, uh, which closed down basically in a very similar process to the one I've just described in Pittsburgh in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, and the university and the university hospital then stood out as overwhelmingly the most, most important actors in the labor market. Um, and quite distinctively at Yale, that has forced in particular university employees to form form themselves all into the same organization, uh, including graduate students. So it's the only place in the country, I think, where graduate students are in the same, are affiliated with the same union as clerical and technical workers and um, food service and, and custodial workers. Um, and I became very involved in that, first through graduate student unionization efforts. And then, uh, you know, the more I got involved in that, the more I was sort of involved in the broader organization. Um, and, uh, that posed all of these questions. I mean, there are all of these differences among those 7,000 people, those 7,000 employees, uh, differences of race, of class in certain ways, or status in any way, of gender, um, in really important ways, the clerical workers are overwhelmingly women. Um, and it was difficult actually to negotiate all, it was possible, but it was difficult to negotiate the unity of those groups and to kind of engage in campaigning and organization and, and struggle together. Um, and I think, I mean, I look back on my own history of that and I would say we lost at least as much as we won. Um, but it also, you know, I could see that there was something about the kind of social process of like what a big complex sort of service providing institution in a post-industrial city uh, is and does and the way it touches everyone's lives, um, both as employees and also as 
you know, tenants and as patients at the hospital and as parents of children who get arrested by Yale cops and all kinds of different kinds of things. Um, I could see that we could figure out how we might all have something in common, right? That actually the, it wasn't easy, it wasn't automatic, but it might be able to be done. And in that way, um, that, I mean, I sometimes joke that actually the, the whole book is a kind of allegory of that experience. Um, because I felt like I was seeing and trying to figure out how to bring out um, like a kind of common class experience, um, not by ignoring or setting aside race and gender and other forms of difference, but by really trying to kind of engage them and figure out how we can come together through them. Um, and so that it was really, really important for me in, in kind of trying to formulate that argument, I guess. Wonderful, thank you very much. Anyone else have a question for Gabe? I'm sure somebody does. Excellent. Patrick Barrett, I'll ask you to unmute. All right. Um, it was a really fantastic uh, talk. And um, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm I had intended to, and I now intend to do so even more. I mean, it's really terrific. Um, it's gone way to the top of my very large list of books to read. Um, so one question that I had, um, or I thought about when you're in, in the presentation was just thinking about class formation. I mean, what are your reflections on, you know, the prospects for a revitalization of a labor movement? Uh, on the one hand, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of political possibility, which you invoked at the very end of the talk. And in that regard, I mean, I, I can't help but think about, you know, the famous argument that Adam Jaworski made um, uh, regarding, you know, the prospects for socialism in, a, in, in the electoral arena and the role that parties play in class formation. And of course, that argument was very much based on a much narrower and traditional uh, definition of what it is to be working class. Yeah. So you're presenting an argument which really sort of um, highlights the degree to which that old definition of the working class um, is outmoded. Um, but I'm just wondering whether you've reflected on the implications of that for the kind of argument that Jaworski was making. Now, of course, it's the case that most of what he's talking about is the European experience in the U.S electoral system is so different that it shapes things to a degree that I think, you know, makes things much messier, but I'm just curious about all that. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm obsessed with Jaworski, so I'm really glad to get this question. <laughs> um, I, I, Jaworski, is, I'm notorious for telling every graduate student I meet to, to you know, read Jaworski and write about Jaworski, so uh, I'm, I have a lot to say about this. Um, you know, I think that, um, Shavorsky, so for those who don't know, which I imagine many of the list days here, Adam Shavorsky is a political scientist who um, basically made this famous argument that the contrary to the expectations of the kind of classical socialist movement, the industrial working class was not steadily growing in size over the course of the 20th century, that that growth uh, became arrested and stagnated at some point. And that uh, would seem to necessitate a rethinking of political strategy because so long as you think that the movement, that the social class that you, your movement represents is steadily growing in size, um, you can kind of sit tight. I mean, not, not really, but you know, you can, you can, you, you, the future belongs to you. And that stagnation then obviously generates a crisis for that, that way of thinking politically. Uh, and basically what Shavorsky said is it poses two options for uh, working class parties in particular. They can uh, form alliances with the liberal middle class, um, which will involve diluting their program and demoralizing their base, but will broaden their base. Or they can refuse to form cross-class alliances and sort of stick to their social base. Uh, and then they will shrink and become a, a smaller and smaller minority politically. Um, and, you know, I think that was a very powerful and important argument. I think what is missing from it, and I don't blame Jaworski for this, I think very, very few people could see this from the perspective of the 70s and 80s, uh, and there's a whole kind of theoretical discourse around these problems that Shavorsky is part of, all of which basically misses this, is that they all think that the emerging new jobs are all white collar. Um, 
you know, and I, that's why I showed you that graph that breaks down in 1992, the occupational distribution of healthcare, because it's a white collar industry, or it's a professional industry, as they understand it. I mean, you know, they might, they might acknowledge, of course, there are some, you know, low wage workers within this industry, but they don't, it doesn't seem like a significant phenomenon, uh, enough to change the analysis. And so an early kind of aha moment for me was when I realized that that assumption was embedded in all of those arguments. And, you know, for understandable reasons in some way, I don't, I don't blame them for it. Um, but I think that uh, the low wage, the kind of reproletarianization, let's say, of large segments of these kind of new workforces did actually, does actually open new possibilities. And the one figure who did see this really clearly was Harry Braverman um, in Labor and Monopoly Capital. And Braverman then influenced also, I think, really critically Barbara Ehrenreich, who was a big influence for me. And Patrick alluded to uh, you know, some of my writing about her concept of, of the professional managerial class, which is precisely an argument about proletarianization in emerging new industries um, or grow, growing industries. Right? So that lets us see a cyclical phenomenon um, in which, like, if you take that perspective, you see a cyclical phenomenon in which uh, over time, sort of tendentially, new industries and new workforces are forming, partly connected to and in the shadow of existing forms of uh, both employment and also working class organization. Uh, that they, and the connections between those are important to trace out because it's not discontinuous, right? Um, one moment in working class history gains ideological and material and institutional and organizational resources and burdens from the previous moment in working class history. Um, and that's why my book is not just about healthcare, but about steel and healthcare. Um, and I think just to kind of be more concrete then, um, what I think is going on in the story I'm telling is that you do have a proletarianization process of this growing new workforce in this industry that is under these kind of structural pressures around descaling, wage suppression, staffing levels um, that are generating forms of discontent and grievance. Um, but it's not just a repetition, exactly because of the shadow of the previous moment. Um, and what the shadow of the previous moment did, right, the episode of class struggle in the early 20th century basically did, was create the healthcare industry in its particular form, um, where it's this kind of public-private hybrid within which healthcare workers now have to work. And what that means for them is that it's not actually possible to win really significant material gains for healthcare workers outside of politics. Um, because the industry is so much the creation of public policy and the kind of public policy management of class conflict, um, as soon as healthcare unions became legally uh, kind of recognized in the 70s, union organizers began to recognize this right away, that they would be bargaining with hospital administrators and administrators would say, well, we'd love to give you that thing that you're asking for, but that's actually not really up to us. That's actually up to the Medicare uh, reimbursement level. Um, and so I think quite unlike industrial workers who obviously depended on and were engaged in politics in various ways, but did have kind of a direct level of economic leverage, workers in many new service industries, which are very heavily state and policy mediated, um, will have a very hard time kind of making serious gains and establishing broader and broader unity without becoming politicized and building a coalition around themselves. And there's actually already a conceptual apparatus and vocabulary for doing this, which is the concept of bargaining for a common good that has really emerged out of uh, the Chicago Teachers Union in particular here, um, right? The idea that teachers' interests and students' and parents' interests, maybe they're not identical, but they're close enough uh, that they can form a coalition to actually try to engage in uh, public policy struggle and political struggle, and that that is the most important medium at some level for kind of economic conflict or economic transformation in these kinds of industries. Thanks Great. for that. That was wonderful. Stacy has a question. Was the parallel decline in family formation part of the link between deindustrialization and the growth of low wage care workforce? Were young stayers or remainers in steel cities and towns predominantly single mothers? That's a very good question. Um, so yeah, men do leave at higher rates and there's a particular kind of generational cohort that's like 45, 55 um, men to women, which is, it doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but that's actually quite a, a large divergence for uh, 
you know, it's like what you see after a war in like a very bloody war um, when, you know, a lot of men get killed. Um, so uh, there is some significant divergence of that kind. Uh, and there's a big panic, certainly, about both single mothers nationwide, right, in the 80s and 90s, which I think is very much what your question is getting at, um, and about the disintegration of families also. Um, what I generally find in the Pittsburgh context, and it's difficult for me to know how much this generalizes or not, um, is that the economic pressures of deindustrialization and the kind of forces it sets loose on the, at the family level actually more often than they do anything else, compel people to stay together, um, even compel couples, that is, to stay together, uh, even when, you know, they might, that might not really be that attractive of an option, you know, in, in terms of their relationship. And there is some significant kind of social work evidence in this kind of thing about, uh, you know, basically mothers saying, you know, married mothers saying, uh, you know, all of this pressure is on me to keep this family together. Um, and I just have to do it. I just don't have an option. Um, so the, there's a kind of panic about the divorce rate, for example. It doesn't seem to actually rise that significantly in Pittsburgh in this moment, although domestic violence does rise, right? And I think that the, the, that conjunction maybe tells you something. Um, more broadly, though, the divorce rate obviously has gone up nationwide, and you know, uh, non-marital parenthood has increased quite significantly nationwide over the course of the end of the 20th century. And I think that obviously has something to do in a significant way with the kind of crisis of the Fordist, uh, you know, workplace family kind of coupling. Um, and I think there's a lot more work to do to figure out what that set of connections is. So I don't want to just kind of make it up right now. Thank you very much. Gabe, I'll ask you a, a question of my own. Can you tell, uh, tell us more about the relationship of uh, healthcare insurance companies to your story. Um, I'm sure that is very rich. I know that there's definitely a story or many stories here in Wisconsin. So yeah. I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, so, uh, you know, in, I mean, health, health insurance is not a big business basically prior to the 1930s or so. Uh, I mean, it exists marginally, but it's not a big business. Um, and it's really the welfare state, the creation of the welfare state by the New Deal that also creates this kind of like apparatus of um, private, initially largely nonprofit, um, but private insurance providers. My, my graduate school advisor, Jennifer Klein, her first book for all these rights is about this kind of process. Um, so Blue Cross is the important one for, um, you know, lots of groups of industrial workers, including steel workers, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, I described this a bit in the talk, but basically you have these big, big pools of insured people um, who, you know, uh, stabilize but make Blue Cross work actuarially um, and make it able to function as a kind of community rating, you know, broad, broadly available form of insurance for people even beyond steelworkers themselves in a place like Pittsburgh. Um, and on the basis, and, you know, because Blue Cross is collecting all these premia from, you know, U.S. Steel, um, it is able to, you know, it has this kind of very large market um, that it's, a, and it's able to extract what it needs from the employer rather than the workers. And so can basically grow and grow with the, um, with the improvement of their collective bargaining agreements over time. Um, and even with the rising rates of utilization over time, which potentially are bad for an insurer, um, but uh, right, because High, high utilization means that the insurer is paying the hospital more. Um, but basically this kind of fiscal relationship with collective bargaining makes it work all the way through the 70s and 80s. Um, and then something shifts in the 80s, which I didn't really describe in the talk. Um, but uh, in the 80s, uh, due to the, a lot of the patterns I've been describing, uh, in particular, Congress becomes worried about the overexpansion of the Medicare budget uh, and act, and imposes in 1983 what remains the largest change to Medicare since its passage. Um, so forgive me, this is gonna be dry for a moment. From 1965 to 1983, um, Medicare, and in fact, all insurance, which largely modeled itself on Medicare, reimbursed hospitals on a cost plus basis. So, um, you know, hospitals and doctors did whatever they were gonna do. And then their accounting department kind of calculated how much they spent and they sent a bill to the insurer and the insurer gave them like 102% basically, of whatever. So that meant that costs from the perspective of a hospital were revenue. Um, 
And uh, that, so Congress then acts in 1983 to change how Medicare reimburses um, to what's called a, a prospective payment system, where basically the federal government assigns like a price pretty much to every diagnosis. They come up with a list of 467 diagnoses. Department of Health and Human Services attaches a price to each of them. Uh, and then the hospital is free to spend however much it wants, however much it deems appropriate. You can keep the person a day, you can keep them a month, it's up to you. You know how much you're being paid and you have to kind of account around that. And again, private insurance then follows in their wake, but private insurance, not being the federal government, can't impose its cost structure on hospitals. It has to negotiate it with hospitals. Um, and so this sets off from the 1980, early 1980s, really all the way to the present, actually, a market power arms race between insurers and hospitals, where um, the more insurers are able to consolidate with one another or prevent hospitals from consolidating, um, they are going to have more leverage in negotiating their rates with hospitals. And the reverse is true, too. In Pittsburgh, uh, what happens is that, first of all, Blue Cross and Blue Shield merge to form what's called Highmark, um, which then becomes a for-profit entity in the 1990s, I think. Um, Meanwhile, the hospitals all start merging with each other um, and over the course of the 80s, 90s, and into the present um, for the same reason. And then Highmark starts buying hospitals to prevent the hospitals from getting too consolidated. And the hospital system, UPMC, start, launches its own insurance company, again, for the same reason. So they invade each other's markets. Um, and for a period of time, in fact, quite recently, um, they wouldn't do, Highmark and UPMC wouldn't do business with each other. So you couldn't use the region's biggest insurance company at the region's biggest hospital chain. Um, and, you know, the state government had to get involved. It became a kind of issue in the gubernatorial race and this kind of thing. Um, so basically there's this kind of power struggle going on, which largely hospitals have the upper hand in, uh, at least in a place like Pittsburgh, I think, uh, in particular because they are, it's easier for a hospital to launch an insurance company than for an insurance company to successfully operate hospitals. Um, so if they're going to try to vertically integrate in that way, uh, that tends to be a more successful path. And that's like what HMOs are, right? HMOs originate uh, actually as a kind of demand from the left, from the workers' movement itself, right? To have something like a kind of NHS type model, but just for a given workforce. Um, this is what uh, Kaiser is actually, for example, like Kaiser was a steel company. Right, that gradually, I mean, it, you know, it, uh, there was an HMO for the steel workers, and gradually that became the whole business. Um, but oh, in the in the eighties and especially the nineties, uh, it becomes it, it sort of shifts, and it becomes a way for uh, for in particular hospitals to try to get or insurers to try to get leverage on hospitals, and somewhat the other way around too. Thank you so much. We have time for maybe one more question for Gabe. Who wants to take that opportunity? Excellent, Patrick Iver. Hi, Gabe, thanks so much for, uh, for this talk. I have a question that switches gears a little bit. Um, and I'd like to just make an observation about the way that historians work. I mean, on the one hand, uh, our books are written for each other as specialists. And on the other hand, we try to communicate to a non-expert audience. And this means that we often um, sort of hide the, the theoretical work that undergirds the um, presentation of evidence that we're putting out because we think that the, <laughs> if there's an audience, they won't be as interested in it. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm wondering, um, as somebody who's clearly thought uh, carefully about um, the sort of theoretical foundations of the work that you're doing, what, um, what theorists you found most useful and how your views of those theorists evolved over the course of your research? Yeah, I mean, I, do, I really appreciate that question. You know, I think um, a lot of the kind of core theoretical apparatus, especially as I was writing it as a dissertation, arose out of the uh, um, basically the socialist feminist and the tradition and you know what's often called social reproduction theory mm -hmm. um, I think if I had if you'd asked me seven or so years ago let's say to name a theorist who my, my research was kind of trying to embody 
um, I would have said Nancy Frazier, um, who you know is a kind of great theorist of uh, the relationship between the money economy and the kind of world, the uncommodified world of social reproduction. Um, I uh, that's been challenged some for me over time. I think. Um, in particular, because there's a critique of Frazier and a social reproduction theory that I found myself grappling with from elsewhere in the kind of roughly Marxist feminist world um, that Frazier or social reproduction theory more broadly um, treat the household and more broadly like the world of social reproduction, the welfare state, let's say, um, as being external to capital. Um, or more external to capital than is really justifiable. Um, and that in particular becomes a conceptual challenge when you're trying to describe, as my project is trying to describe, the breaching of that boundary, um, right? The ways that elements of social reproductive labor are getting kind of you know, pulled out of the home and into the market. That, that's actually can be quite hard to account for, I think, in, in the story that, that uh, Frazier tells. Uh, I'm not, I don't mean to say she couldn't do it. I can sort of imagine how she would, but she doesn't really do it. Um, and so, um, you know, that caused me to kind of somewhat develop a new layer of influences, in particular, Melinda Cooper uh, and her book, Family Values, which is about um, sort of neoliberalism and neoconservatism and the relationship between them in particular around the regulation of gender and sexuality. Um, and she, she's the person who levels that critique of Frazier, I think, most powerfully. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, Cooper, and on the other hand, I, I'll say I became increasingly, I always had a kind of like interest in Gramsci uh, and Gramscian analysis going throughout the project in some way. But I increasingly, um, in the last couple of years, got into Stuart Hall, um, who I think of as the kind of best modern interpreter of Gramsci. Um, and what Hall is really good with, good for is thinking about um, the relationship between sectors or parts of a social formation that seem to obey different rules, uh, a, a relationship that he calls articulation, um, and uh, understanding how parts of a social formation that seem to obey or do obey in important ways different rules uh, or have different kind of ordering logics to them internally. Uh, still are, can be articulated together to kind of form uh, a whole that we can understand in its totality. And thinking about the relationship between family, industrial workplace, uh, welfare state, uh, and then these kind of weird public-private welfare institutions, i.e. hospitals, um, that became really important for me too. And on that note, uh, we will end it there. I would like to thank uh, Professor Gabriel Winant from the University of Chicago for giving us a really wonderful final lecture for the spring 2022 uh, Visiting Scholars Program Lecture Series. Thank you all for attending this talk and many others. We are, of course, in the planning stages for the following year, and we look forward to seeing you then. Until then, be well, take care, uh, and see you. Thanks, everyone.